Good evening and welcome to our Prostate Cancer Survivorship Series. I'm Dr. Michael Lutz and we're joined by two very special guests this evening whom we'll talk with in just a little bit. Uh, we choose a lot of different topics on our survivorship series because you tell us what you want. And tonight, these were selected by some of our attendees of previous events. We'd like to start off by thanking many of our sponsors because without them, we could never hold events such as these. We want to first thank Lanthius, the makers of Polarify, who support prostate cancer survivorship through the development of their PSMA PET CT scan. Bayer Pharmaceuticals, who develop an advanced oral antiandrogen, Nubeca, Blue Earth Diagnostics, who also make PSMA imaging and are developing radiopharmaceutical therapeutic agents to help treat advanced prostate cancer. And of course, the American Cancer Society, who are helping all of us celebrate more birthdays. Our foundation has been very successful over the years, and we have numerous events. And I would like you to take a chance to go to our MIUmensHealthFoundation.org site and see the upcoming events. June is International Men's Health Month, and we'll be kicking it off on Blue Monday Men's Health, June 12th. And if you take a chance to dress up in blue and do something in blue that day, do something healthy, do something healthy with your family, take advantage of kicking off International Men's Health Week and join us for this International Men's Health cause. In addition, on June 12th, we'll be holding our annual Cogs and Kegs bicycle ride event at Griffin Claw in Birmingham. The event will have over 300 cyclists. There'll be a 10 mile and a 30 mile ride. And they'll be uh, actually uh, having uh, the Michigan State Police and the local township police helping us out making this ride not only safe, but also escorted. And if you've never experienced an escorted bicycle ride, you've never experienced a bike ride. So I would totally recommend you come and join us on Monday night, June 12th for Cogs and Kegs at Griffin Claw. Our golf gala will be at Top Golf on June 15th. Uh, we've been holding it there for the last three years. It's a great night of uh, entertainment with each other, golfing, hitting some golf balls, competing a little bit, and showing us each who can hit a better golf ball. So it's kind of a fun night to just celebrate all of us being together for a, a great evening. And then lastly, the run for the ribbon at the Detroit Zoo on Sunday, June 18th, Father's Day. It's our annual run at the Detroit Zoo, celebrating prostate cancer survivorship for patients and their families. Uh, it's a great outing. It's uh, one of my favorite runs of the year. And uh, if you have a great uh, chance, come join us at the Detroit Zoo. Your bib will get you into the zoo for free. So if you sign up for the run, come join us, form a team, uh, really do something special to help support the men in your community. And our run for the ribbon is one way to really take advantage and do that. For prostate cancer survivorship, we continue to offer the Blue Fund for those of you who have uh, either friends or relatives who are being uh, diagnosed with prostate cancer and are having difficulty affording their personal financial expenses, they may qualify for our Blue Fund, which will allow them up to $1,000 a month for their personal financial expenses. This is a one-of-a-kind fund that was formed in 2015, and as of this date, we have funded almost $100,000 in funding for our men's health community. And lastly is our On Call for Men's Health podcast series. Uh, I think that if you want to learn something that is kind of different and interesting, uh, you would find this very worthwhile. Uh, I'm told I'm not on the screen. Find out why. You are now, Dr. Lutz. I am now? Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and our podcast series, On Call for Men's Health, is a, is a fabulous way uh, to learn a little bit about uh, individuals who are either prostate cancer survivors, uh, men's health, uh, learn a little bit about beer and beer experts, uh, learn a little bit about the emotional and personal history of, of a testicular cancer survivor. Uh, we have all kinds of different stories on our podcast. So you can go to our uh, website or you can go to, uh, to Sirius XM. Um, or Spotify or Pandora, where all of our uh, all of our podcasts are being listed. Uh, that's enough said. I think I've talked enough. I'd like to actually get into our guest panelists uh, tonight. We're really very fortunate to have um, two integrative health experts, uh, Dr. Shabo Roy, uh, as well as Dr. Jeffrey Mensa. Uh, we have worked together uh, numerous occasions in the past. We're very fortunate to have them. Uh, they name, know more about this topic than I could ever hope to know, and that's why they're here, and I'm not going to be talking. So I would really like you to just spend a moment, uh, Dr. Roy, if you could start out and tell us a little bit about 
your education, your training, and a little bit about your passion. Am I not, am I muted? Now I can hear you perfectly. Thank you. So blah, 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 honor to be here. <laughs> I was saying that I have a doctorate in natural medicine as does Dr. Mensa. Um, both of us did residency in family practice with extended family practice hours. And I did my fellowship in something called integrative oncology. A fellowship is where you become an expert in a specific kind of thing and learn to forget everything else. Um, and I did that in Philadelphia with uh, Eastern Regional, Hahnemann University and Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Um, and Dr. Mensa did the same. He's now in his second year of a five-year fellowship here in Michigan. Uh, we recruited him because of his interest in men's health and our hope is that he subspecializes in prostate. So when I say, uh, integrative oncology, I think it's worth explaining what that means, Dr. Lutz, if you think the same. S can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly. Okay, perfect. So integrative oncology um, is, is a term that means our job is to offer supportive care for patients who have been diagnosed with cancer or are going through cancer treatment. Um, to prevent side effects from hormone therapy, surgery, radiation, help to mitigate the long-term effects from those things. Um, chemotherapy, if they do need chemotherapy, um, and targeted therapies, so specific drugs that target different kinds of cancers. Our job is also to optimize outcomes in the long run to lower risk of progression or lower risk of recurrence. And in your population, when patients are in active surveillance, to lengthen the time from which they're diagnosed to when they do eventually need treatment. And uh, Dr. Mensa, a little bit about your story. Absolutely. Um, so as Dr. Roy was saying, I do have a doctorate in nat natural medicines and I schooled in Chicago with my extended <laughs> family residency hours. Um, I took a special interest in men's health as well as cancer care and post finishing those hours, I really wanted to find the overlap or the intersection where I can take both oncology care and then also men's health to treat patients. Well, you know, tonight is actually a men's health night. I know we're here to talk about prostate cancer survivorship, but the one thing that I think a lot of patients will ask over and over again is, is that once they're diagnosed, they go, what can I do to help myself? Right. And, and, and uh, we're very fortunate. We have a board member, uh, Dr. Mark Moyad, who is uh, known very well for nutritional supplements and also works in the Department of Urology at the University of Michigan. And one of his famous taglines is, if it's heart healthy, it's prostate healthy. Mm -hmm. And so I love to use that line because it's one thing that people truly understand. Mm -hmm. uh, they understand how to eat well or eat better. They understand that exercise plays a significant role in health and well-being. And they understand the role of sleep and lifestyle and stress, reduction of stress and anxiety. I'm touching on all the things that you do. This is, and, and, and what you do is more. And so I think that what I'd like to do is ask Dr. Roy, who, who's the ideal patient to, to be seen and when should they be seen? So there's no such thing as an ideal patient, right? We see anybody anywhere in treatment. It's always better in terms of outcomes to get someone um, who's looking at prostate cancer prevention, um, rather than someone who's later in their journey and looking to try and reverse outcomes. Um, because early intervention, uh, as with everything in life, is key. And as you mentioned, prostate cancer and prostate cancer outcomes or prostate health in general is closely linked to metabolic health, how we use fat and sugar, what our cardiovascular health looks like, what our stress picture looks like, and being able to intervene early sometimes can be more powerful. However, there is no such thing as an ideal patient. We see patients anywhere in that journey. 
So yeah. were, you, were you hinting for a moment we could prevent prostate cancer? Because if you did, I mean, people would love to know if there's a way to do that. So as you know, um, a lot of these cancers can be to some extent linked to lifestyle choices, right? Prostate cancer is a disease of aging. So you well know that as we age, um, if we autopsy maybe every 80 year old or every 90 year old man, um, we're gonna see a large percentage of them have prostate cancer. It's not really an avoidable disease in that sense, but how we look at diseases of aging and what we can do to extend the time before we start to age in that way is really critical. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think that a lot of people don't understand that, that, you know, they've done autopsy studies and they found that almost 40% of men at autopsy globally will have prostate cancer. Uh, however, clinical disease, disease that actually expresses itself and spreads within the human body and causes the maladies that men suffer from, doesn't occur uh, in the same amount. And even more importantly, doesn't occur in the same amount globally. And we'll mm -hmm. see higher incidence of clinical prostate cancer, disease that actually expresses itself and such as in the uh, in areas of Africa or the Caribbean, uh, also in you know some parts of Europe and in parts of the U.S. and lower incidence, uh, perhaps in in the Far East. Uh, we don't know how much of it could be dietary or stress related or other lifestyle factors. Right, but we do know that some choices like eating a diet lower in saturated fat, working on obesity. Um, getting metabolic markers under control, meaning what your cholesterol picture looks like, what your sugar picture looks like, that those things can be very helpful in preventing the way that prostate cancer expresses itself, if it expresses itself. And I think that's always a great thing to talk about. So, so Dr. Menso, ideally, when, when should someone like yourself get involved in seeing a patient? That's a good question. I would say as soon as possible, because as we were touching upon, prostate patients can be active surveillance. They also can be in treatment. Um, so depending on where they are in their journey with prostate disease is going to determine how doctors like myself and Dr. Roy can intervene and support But even, you know, half our population comes to us with, you know, prostate metastatic to the bone, let's say. Mm -hmm. And those patients still do well with supportive care. So those in our clinic, we have a multidisciplinary approach. So one, we work very closely with urology, but also we have nutrition, nutrition oncology, massage, Reiki, counselors who are specialists in grief, depression, identity changes, and specialists like myself and Dr. Mensa, who can look at hormone therapy, first line, second line, um, third generation therapy, and look at the side effects that present, for example, hot flashes, um, changes in what our, how our body looks, changes in sleep, changes in um, mood, uh, depression, and work on those things from a supportive care perspective using natural therapies, nutrition, and lifestyle changes to not only radically change quality of life, but I have people who came to me eight years ago who are still on first line ADT, you know, so, and it's a smaller population than what you see. And as we just talked about, all of it is correlation, not necessarily causal, but I mean, natural therapies and nutrition are hugely impactful, even for someone who's metastatic to the bone. So you talked about some additional services that you offer. So I just had a curiosity, uh, if you could talk a little bit about hypnotherapy, acupuncture, yoga, massage, herbal medicines, and how these play a role and how you do offer them uh, to patients for their treatment options. Yeah, so Dr. Mess, you want to start with herbal therapy and then I'll pick up with acupuncture and hypnotherapy. Absolutely. So a lot of the botanicals or herbal therapies that we use, um, as you we were just discussing, can be used for the side effects of ADT. So that is how our body uses fats and sugars. That can be also our mood changes. That can be also things like bone density as well. Um, when we're using these botanicals or herbal therapies, one thing that we always like to do is making sure they're well-sourced because sometimes people um, online, as if we Google a lot, can sell several types of things that they call natural therapies, several types of supplements. And we don't really have a way of regulating 
the sourcing and the quality of these products. So that's why I feel like it's super, super important to see doctors like myself and Dr. Roy, because one, we know how to use these botanicals. We know how to use these in a cancer population as well. Is there a trustworthy resource where you can look and tell whether this botanical that they're using is from a trusted authority since they're not FDA regulated? No. So the government does regulate supplements, but they regulate them under the USDA, like a banana. So it's almost impossible for the average person on the other side of this table to know if, let's say they're taking arginine for erectile dysfunction, if that is sourced properly, if what it says on the bottle is what's in the bottle. However, we, as part of our doctoral training, have um, a really in-depth understanding of the company's that manufacture supplements and which companies are willing to go through an FDA-like process for verification of ingredient source efficacy mm -hmm. for control. They allow third-party testing, batch testing, and we only recommend supplements from those companies that are pharmaceutical grade. The unfortunate thing in this country, Dr. Lutz, is that Patients can't buy directly usually from those manufacturers. They usually need a doctor's recommendation or need to order through a doctor's NPI. So they do have to see someone like yourself or myself to be able to source those kinds of supplements. Um, so there is a risk in just taking things over the counter, as Dr. Mensa said, or Googling something and thinking it'll be of benefit to you because there's also let's just take one supplement as an example. Let's use fish oil. Fish mm -hmm. oil, you know, is an excellent therapeutic for um, cardiovascular health, right? To manage lipids, to lower inflammation in the system, which has been shown clinically to help with um, slowing progression with prostate. The problem with fish oil is multifold. One, where are we sourcing these fish from? They're usually large cold water fish that um, carry other uh, contaminants in their tissues. So when we're taking that supplement, we're taking those contaminants as well. Mm -hmm. The other problem can be if the person was a previous smoker and they're taking high doses of fish oil, it can result in uh, cancers that are higher grade at diagnosis or progress faster. There are large trials that looked at fish oil in high doses and in fact found like the SELECT trial found that high doses of fish oil in um, men prior to diagnosis resulted in more aggressive disease at diagnosis. And then the other problems with fish oil is um, it can't be combined with certain kinds of therapies because it either potentiates the therapy, meaning makes it work more effectively, or it'll interfere with the therapy. Like for example, I'll take something else, green tea. A lot of people know that green tea is an excellent therapeutic and people think of it as cancer fighting, but it uses the same pathway in the liver as some of the androgen deprivation therapy does and competes with it and can lower efficacy by sometimes 60%. I don't want people to think they shouldn't take natural therapies. I want them to know when you're taking natural therapies, it has to be looked at from a skilled perspective in terms of what's right for you, where are we getting it from, and how does it play nicely with your current treatment from urology or uro uro oncology? Okay. So, uh, Dr. Roy, I was going to also now have you go on a little bit um, to talk about the hypnotherapy, acupuncture, yoga, and massage. Yeah. So there's, if you go on pubmed.gov, which is where, when patients tell me they're on the internet, that's where I like them to go. I prefer that they go to pubmed.gov and put in the therapeutic that they're interested in. It can be anything from blueberries to acupuncture and capitalize A and D and put in prostate or prostate cancer, you're going to see a lot of data there. And then if you click on the left on clinical trial, it'll filter that data for the data that's been shown in human populations, usually in a hospital setting. Acupuncture is excellent for um, nerve pain and it and is well evidenced for pain in general. 
Um, and then there's been some smaller, less robust studies looking at acupuncture for prostatitis. So when the prostate is enlarged and or and or inflamed, and we don't know that it's going to progress, the acupuncture has been used for that as well. Those studies are mainly in Southeast Asia. Um, but well established for pain syndromes and nerve problems. Um, hypnosis, we don't use in our clinic. And I don't want to speak uh, out of my purview and talk about something I don't know too much about. But what I will tell you is we use a lot of guided visualization and mindfulness meditation techniques. So all of our therapists are trained in mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is a strategy of bringing your conscious mind to your experience. It has good data that it helps with pain, sleep, depression, anxiety, and even outcome. Um, and the third one you asked about was massage. Um, our massage therapists on staff are oncology certified. They've all been practicing for a long time. They're good at creating safe space they also know how to work with patients on bringing themselves back into their body. When we're diagnosed with a disease, we can get in this sort of like combative place where we're fighting the disease and we disassociate a bit from ourselves. And massage has good data that helps bring people back into their bodies, helps people bring people back into the present. And there's even data that therapeutic touch does um, improve prognosis with cancer globally. A lot of times we talk about um, habits and lifestyle when we refer to prostate cancer survivorship. I'd like to hear from both of you. What are your thoughts and recommendations? And you know, what are a good start? What are some things that people can do who are watching right now to improve prostate cancer survivorship in their own personal habits and lifestyle? Dr. Mensa? Absolutely. Um, I would say things that we can do at home would be one, cutting out what I like to call crap. That's your candies, that's your refined sugars, that's the foods that we know that we are allergic to. Those are your processed foods. Um, things that, another thing that we can do are strategies with our exercise. So oftentimes I think when we want to be a gym goer or we're trying to get into physical fitness or shape, we think we have to hit the gym and the weights super, super heavy, which isn't the case. Um, there's more data to show it's the consistency. So the regular regimen that you have daily in practice that is more suited for prostate health than just intensity. Yeah, so I think what he's saying is super simple. And if I could even simplify that further, if you are eating candy, um, then that's a good place to start, perhaps eating less candy. Um, if you are eating fast food, maybe making a conscious effort to cut it down to once a week or twice a week. It starts with small steps and it may feel like, well, is that enough? Uh, you may not think it's enough, but your body is going to perceive it as a way of lowering inflammation in your system. So the whole purpose of changing our nutrition or changing our exercise or changing our lifestyle is to lower inflammation in the system. Inflammation is like a, a car alarm that's constantly going off and it changes the way that cell that um, cancer cells are able to use fat and sugar and so by just cutting out candy or reducing your dependence on fast food, you are actually making significant steps towards better health. Um, so I love those things. I love those few things. And I would add that the data on the whole shows us a couple of things. Dr. Lutz, one is to aim for eating more plants. So if you're eating steak, fine, you're eating steak. I don't love it, but I like it, right? If you can make half your plate, three quarters of your plate, a vegetable along with that steak, instead of it being a side dish, instead make it more of a main dish, that can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Um, using a smaller plate can make a huge difference. So eating not, not just not eating as much and eating mostly whole foods. So if you're going to eat a steak, let's make it a grass fed, grass finished piece of meat and not something that you're buying from Burger King or Arby's, wherever you or whoever you're promoting. 
or not. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know, we t- one thing I tell a lot of patients is is they, you know, I, I tell them that you know carbs are not the end of you, but the high glycemic mm-hmm. carbs are. Mm-hmm. And I tell them to go and look up the glycemic index and start with things that, that try and find carbs that you like or enjoy that are lowest on the glycemic index that don't get those insulin surges. And that's usually my discussion I have with most patients uh, so that they, uh, you know, they still get that enjoyment of a carb because carbs are addictive, as we all know. And, mm-hmm. you know, we don't want to you know, promote eating, you know, boxes of candy, but we do want people to still enjoy a, a balanced nutrition, balanced quality of life. Absolutely. And go ahead. No, you go ahead. Oh, and just to tie those two points with eating vegetables and um, monitoring our carbs, I agree 100%, Dr. Lutz. Like carbs are not the enemy. In fact, vegetables have carbs, our whole grains have carbs, our beans and legumes have carbs, which are completely healthy for us and important in balancing our diet and not just prostate treatment, but also survivorship as well. Yeah, we don't believe there's no such thing as a bad food or a good food, really, as long as it's a whole food. Bananas don't cause cancer. Rice doesn't cause cancer. How uh, developing a different relationship with food is the ways that we can transform things. So it's actually, I think, hard on patients to hear there is such a thing as a bad food. No disrespect, Mike. I mean, Dr. Lutz. <laughs> I, I got you. No, 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 I'm good. So um, I there's a comment that a fortified body can withstand the answer to disease more easily and improve one's natural healing abilities. So what are your tools to offer people to in, improve their natural defenses? I guess I, I'll go with Dr. Mensa first because that's what uh, Dr. Roy keeps doing. So I'm going to, I'll save her the, <laughs> save her the cue. You're catching on. <laughs> um, one thing that I will say first is Um, I read a lot of data about the microbiome. I think that's a huge popular term that's coming up in our medical fields and also with patients who are Googling or trying to enhance their own health. Um, The microbiome is just the city of organisms that live in our gut. And keeping in mind, most of our immune system lives inside of our gastrointestinal tract. And a lot of data shows the way that we're able to optimize and improve our microbiome health actually informs our immune system with how to be more effective and more deliberate in fighting disease and to healing our body. Yeah, and I I love that you just said that. And I I would answer that question so differently. Um, So I'm gonna say yes, yes, yes to all that. And then I'm gonna just say it a little more like step-by-step. So. Mm -hmm. When a patient is referred to us by Dr. Lutz or any of our wonderful urologists, the first thing we do is we spend an hour and a half going over um, a complete history. An hour and a half is a long time with a doctor. So we get to know you really well. You get to know us really well. And what we're looking at is how you manage stress, what your coping mechanisms are, uh, whether you have a history of anxiety and depression, or whether you just struggle with managing anger, managing mood. We look at how you eat, when you eat, what you eat. We look at whether you're having sex, whether you wanna have sex, what's going on with erectile function. And we look at that in a detailed way. We look at um, how you sleep, what time you sleep, uh, whether you wake up during the night, how how often you pee, what goes on with your stream. Um, So we're asking you a lot of invasive questions, but the goal is to get a very holistic, to use a buzz term, picture of what your life actually looks like as an individual man facing aging and aging well. Forget about prostate and prostate cancer, facing aging and aging well. Because as Dr. Lutz and I just said, you know, prostate cancer is a disease of aging. You know, it's not necessarily um, something that we should all be frightened about. It's about how we age, right? Once we take that history, we do a comprehensive workup on you. So that can include going back to urology for some tests. It can include some heart tests, like an EKG. It can include um, 
uh, pulmonary function test, it depends on the person, but we definitely do blood work. And in that blood work, we look at metabolic markers. Metabolic markers are how your body is using the fat and sugar that you're consuming, how stress is managed in your body, and how it relates to the sugar that lives in your body. We look at risk predictors for heart disease. We look at hormonal health outside of testosterone. So for example, your thyroid hormone, which helps your body to manage energy and fat and sugar. Once we have all of that data and we go over it with you in person, we develop a comprehensive plan in conjunction with whatever you're doing with urology. So let's say urology has a watch and wait approach. You're in active surveillance. They're seeing you for digital rectal rotating with MRI. Our job is to see you in conjunction with those visits and work on what we're seeing your metabolic picture to do to be, what we're seeing your stress picture to be, what your other risk factors are, and optimizing your health to, and tracking your PSA through urology to see if it's responding to those strategies. And not just your PSA, but your lipid profile, in particular your triglycerides, your HbA1c, which is a fancy way of looking at sugar over a three month period, all of those pieces. Um, so it's a really exciting and a comprehensive approach to looking at prostate and men's health in general that has nothing that's, that's very, that's almost, um, it should be standard of care. We were just talking about this before we got started. And it's extraordinary to me to say that it's not because you cannot separate out your health metabolically, cardiovascularly, sexually, and emotionally from prostate cancer or prostate health. You can't. No, and, and as urologists, we do a, a really horrible job at assessing the role of anxiety and stress that people face. And we know there's recurrent data that shows that men who are on active surveillance uh, for their prostate cancers have a twofold increased incidence of anxiety, depression than the general population. And we also know that men once diagnosed with prostate cancer for the first 90 days have a higher incidence of suicide risk than any other solid malignancy in the human body. And I don't think these are addressed. I don't think these are even mentioned. And that's why your role is so valuable. Your, your presence is so valuable uh, in this process. And I think that it's not, shouldn't be ever undervalued. And that's why we've had this conversation on numerous occasions, why we speak through our voice of as the foundation uh, that we want to get people involved in holistic care uh, as an adjunct and become an integral part of their care uh, so that it becomes more mainstream for their care and their survivorship. And I, I love that you're saying that because and it gives me it just makes me so angry uh, to hear those statistics around suicide because you know, there's, then there's all the comorbidities associated with, you know, um, depression. So you mentioned that just the diagnosis causes depression. Well, antidepressants, which are usually what's prescribed, then feed back and worsen the risk of erectile dysfunction, for example. Mm -hmm. Erectile dysfunction becomes a significant factor in depression itself. Mismanagement of erectile dysfunction is a factor in depression hormone therapy itself can be a contributor to depression. Diabetes can be a contributor. So we're, and I think guys are really underserved in this space. Mm -hmm. Like breast cancer has a huge advocacy behind it and a huge amount of drive behind it for solutions in a space where men are largely ignored. Um, and, and, and I almost don't think that we understand as clinicians, how much erectile function is a, integral piece of a man's identity. So when they all of a sudden, boom, hit that cliff and drop off, it's like, who am I? You know, how do I identify myself? What does it mean to be a man? And how can I bring um, strength and connection to my marriage? And that's actually a big piece we work on. Um, not just uh, erectile dysfunction, but reframing sexual health and sexual relationship in a marriage or a partnership, um, which is a big piece of preventing um, and mitigating depression. I, you know, I, it, it is, a, is amazing that, you know, this is just not addressed in general. And uh, what do you have as, do you have any simple first 
steps that you do when you're assessing anxiety and depression in patients when they uh, land on your doorstep? Dr. Mentz, is it okay if I, I know you're hearing my sure. voice a lot, guys, but just if I, if I just jump in. So we use a simple screen called a GAD7, which I'm sure you know well, um, where, and a PHQ9. So we ask questions like, would you like me to just screen you, Dr. Dr. Letts? No, go ahead. Can I screen you? So I would sure. ask you. If you like. So I would ask you, um, so uh, Dr. Letts, can you tell me, um, are you struggling with, I want you to answer every day, most days, some days, never. And okay. I'm going to repeat that. Are you struggling with um, sleeping too much or sleeping too little? Every day, most days, some days, never. Um, some days. Feeling like you're eating too much or eating too little? Every day, most days, some days, never. Never. Feeling like you've let yourself or your family down? Every day, most days, some days, never. Some days. Mm -hmm. Who have you let down, yourself or your family? I would say both. Mm -hmm. And how do you think you might be letting yourself down, Mike? Um, I don't know if I'm not you know, working at my full capacity, if I'm either tired or I'm drained or I'm, I'm not being perfectly you know, content when I'm taking care of patients and I'm like off. Like feeling like you're not present. Right. Yeah, fully present. So you put a lot of pressure on yourself to be present. Well, and every time, yeah. Yeah, I see that. Feeling like you are down, depressed, or hopeless every day, most days, some days, never. Never. Feeling like um, you're having trouble focusing, like reading a newspaper, watching television every day, most days, some days, never. Some days. Mm -hmm. um, feeling like you may harm yourself or others. Every Never. Day. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate how honest and upfront you were. You're not scoring for depression. Um, you To score, you need a five out of 21, you're a three. Um, but I think it's worth thinking about how you bring, how you put so much pressure on yourself to be fully present, because that would be hard for all of us, especially mm -hmm. in the field that you're in. So I'm gonna pause there. Dr. Lutz is not my patient, but um, I think it's a good way to demonstrate and actually I want you guys who are listening to think about your answers to those questions and whether or not you would fall on a screen. It's not about whether you're answering every day, most days, some days, or never. It's how many times you answer some days. Um, and at a five or above, that qualifies for a clinical depression. Is that helpful, Mike? I think it is. And I'm hoping that people who see this will understand that, you know, it's, that's really what it's all about is trying to be uh, assessing yourself, you know, seeing where you're at. Yeah. And be somewhat introspective. And so because we have an hour and a half in that first visit, you know, we're really digging deep. And you saw just in that two minutes that you and I talked the level of presence that I'm bringing to that screen is a little different than if a primary care is asking it. And unfortunately, when primary care, when, when our family practice doc or a urologist hears that we might be struggling with depression, they're often prescribing an antidepressant, um, which can worsen erectile function. So I think um, working on erectile function, um, reframing erectile function, understanding how this man identifies himself, working on relationship stressors outside of prostate issues. All of those pieces are critical to helping this man move into his identity outside of erectile function. But we also, of course, rely on PD-5 inhibitors, on vibration therapy, on um, even uh, other kinds of physical and manual therapies, like uh, this may sound horrible, but low dose electric shock therapy is very helpful. We mm -hmm. look at massage, pelvic floor therapy. There's so many ways to look at bringing blood flow to the nerves that innervate or make the penis and that whole system work well. But I have talked for a really long time. So I feel like the next question should go to Dr. Mensa. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, actually it will because, you know, Dr. Mensah previously talked about the immune system. You just mm -hmm. brushed on it. And so what mm -hmm. I'd like to do is to have you talk a little bit more about are there tools that you can do to assess and or enhance one's immune system uh, when uh, being treated for uh, prostate cancer, for instance, or any other oncologic disease? Absolutely. Um, one thing that I basic test that we can use to look at our immune function is our CBC. What are white blood cells? And simply put, the white blood cells are the soldiers that are contracted or employed by our immune system. So they help us fight bacterial infections. They may help us fight viruses. They might help us fight our mold, our food sensitivities. And we can look at that and see, okay, based on your labs, this is what I'm seeing is deficient in our immune function. Other things that we can do, like I said, is assessing our microbiome. So I do a lot of functional testing. So we can test actually what's happening inside of our gut and our intestinal tract to see if our bodies are actually breaking down the foods, breaking down and absorbing the nutrients properly, because that's super, super important in our health. And also it's super, super important in giving the energy and nutrients to our immune system. Yeah, so good bowel function then would be what, Dr. Mensa? So good bowel function would be um, bowel movements that are well-formed, easy to pass. So things that you want to look at, is my stool any funny colors other than our browns? Also, other than my spinach, corn, blueberries, do I have undigested foods in my stool? Um, does my stool sink or float? Those are really good ways to indicate on just how our microbiome and our gut function is doing. Also gas and bloating, wouldn't you say, is a, is mm -hmm. a good indicator, um, whether you feel bloated after you eat and whether you have mood changes after you eat, like you feel sluggish, slow, lack of right. concentration after eating. Mm -hmm. So just out of curiosity, how do you convince the mainstream physicians and caregivers, they're, they're really a source of referral. They sometimes actually control patient referrals because patients in general uh, may not know that you exist or your services exist or that there's a world beyond mainstream healthcare because at this point, uh, holistic care and integrative medicine isn't thought of by patients in general as the first train of thought. They think of chemotherapies, they think of interventional therapies as the way they're gonna get cured from their, from their prostate cancer or their other malignancies. So how do you approach a healthcare provider and explain the benefits that you can offer to patients so that you can get these patients the full service care that they really need? How did you and I meet, Dr. Lutz? I don't remember. Because of our foundation many, many years ago. So, you know, uh, one, first of all, I just want to let people know we're in Bloomfield um, and our website is sort of in that, I don't know, it's not in there. It's aim, A-I-M, natural.com. So it's Associates of Integrative Medicine, natural.com. Um, but we, 80% of our population, actually, Dr. Lutz, is uh, direct referral from oncology or urology. And I think the reason why is because we have such good outcomes, patients are happy, and then they tell their oncologist or their urologist that they're happy. So I think one of the ways that that people like ourselves need to build is to really focus on the patient in front of you and have good outcomes. Um, it helps to do in-services. So when we can, when we have time, we go visit urology, we visit oncology, and we talk about what we do, um, papers that we might have published or data that might be coming out. We do a ton of public speaking um, with organizations like the Men's Health Foundation or Gilda's or Mioka or any of these uh, not-for-profits that work in the space of education and cancer. Um, I would say we speak uh, almost bi-monthly um, and we try our best to in those in those settings to connect with oncology and neurology and give them a sense that we're not competitive. The problem with Michigan is that you're fairly vulnerable in Michigan because there is no regulation around the term holistic, integrative, natural. It doesn't mean anything. So anybody in Michigan call, can call themselves holistic. Um, and that can be dangerous whether they're an MD 
or whether they're uh, a, a herbalist veterinarian. I'm not saying that any of those things are bad. I'm just saying everybody claims to be an expert in this field and nobody regulates it in the state. So I have had prostate cancer patients who have come to me and they've been seeing a large animal vet and getting medications that are intended for horses that can be dangerous to them. Um, so it's, it's frustrating and difficult for the patient who's trying to navigate that. Uh, you're looking for someone who has the letters F-A-B-N-O after their name, because that means that they're boarded in integrative oncology. And I think educating providers like urology and oncology that were out there, that there's four or five of us in Michigan, and that we're, we're skilled in seeing their patients and we work in conjunction with them, I think is the trick. The problem with urology and oncology is they're rightfully so, they're I'm wary of the quality of care, the skill level, the expertise, and the risk of contraindication, particularly with chemotherapy. Well, you know, in urology, one of the areas that your services are, you know, very needed is in hormone therapy. You know, we've been doing hormone therapy for prostate cancer since the 1950s, and the hormone shots, uh, which are the LH. RH shots have been around since about the mid 1980s when I was a resident at Ford Hospital. And now they're being used pervasively. And now we're at a point where we don't call it androgen ablation, we call it androgen annihilation, where we now add on top of the, uh, andro the anti-androgen shots, we add on anti-androgen pills so that there's zero androgen levels within our prostate cancer patients. This has been a mainstay uh, for decades. And so how do you help our patients deal with the side effects? And what are some really good options that you could share with those who are watching today that might be helpful for them to improve their success with the hormone therapy and tolerating the side effects thereof? So I think it's helpful to start by talking about the side effects that we do manage. And then Dr. Mensah, I'll have you kind of jump in because we use what we call a biopsychosocial model to approach them. So um, whenever we're blocking testosterone, which is what Dr. Lutz is talking about, and, and Dr. Mensa, don't hesitate to discuss how this impacts black and Latino men differently from perhaps white men. But, um, but uh, whenever we're blocking testosterone or or um, preventing testosterone from being utilized in the body. What we're doing is interfering with the natural use of testosterone in the body. What does testosterone do? So here we're talking about muscle mass, reduction of muscle mass, mm -hmm. changes in the way fat is deposited in the body, changes in heart health, changes in mood and hot flashes. And of course, the big one that everybody worries about, which is erectile function, or many people worry about, is erectile function. So I think what I'll do is kick muscle mass to you, Dr. Mensa, yeah. and then maybe I'll talk about erectile function a little bit more than I already yeah. Absolutely. Um, so with muscle mass, things that we can do one is really looking at our lifestyle choices. So before I talked about the idea of the intensity of your exercise versus the consistency of your exercise. So you, it's really important one to find those exercise regimens that are best for you. So popular things that I do see now that patients are getting into are things like the cross training and the CrossFit, those high intensity workouts. But one thing you want to think about with those are they sustainable for you? So is this something that you can actually do consistently? And one thing with our muscle mass is once we find that sweet spot in our exercise regimen, one is the types of foods that we're eating before and after our workout. So if we're having a more aerobic workout that we know that we're building up the cardio that day, that would be the day that we actually wanna think about how our carbs are incorporated to our nutrition versus if we wanna have a more weight training day, that would be a time to think about our proteins and fats with our nutrition that same day of working out. Um, and the last piece with muscle mass is rest. So the way that we build muscle is that we kind of make those tiny little cuts and a tiny little stresses to the muscle. And then we want to have it rebuild or scar over, so to speak. The only way that we are able to do that effectively is if we have a rest. 
So if we're thinking that we're going to go to the gym every single day of the week, we probably won't get the results in terms of maintaining muscle mass or building muscle mass than having a well-structured, a well-thought-out, consistent plan. Those are all really good ideas. Is that helpful, Dr. Lux? Oh, I totally. Uh, and the other question is uh, hot flashes. I cannot tell you how many times men will complain that the hot flashes are just just taking them down. Yeah. And part of that, again, is that uh, one, the embarrassment of hot, hot flashes, they happen spontaneously, they happen in public. And two, that men associate them with um, a characteristic of menopause and not something that's a characteristic of age, characteristic of aging as a man. Um, there's a lot of data around black cohosh for hot flashes. There's some data around arginine. Um, there's a ton of therapeutics that could be used. Ashwagandha, which is a Chinese or Indian herb. Um, ginseng has some data, although it may be a little too warming. Um, vitamin D has data, magnesium has data. The question is, what is this particular man facing? So if we're talking about um, let's say we're talking about a 72-year-old white male with uh, prostate metastatic to the bone, diagnosed metastatic at presentation, who's on androgen deprivation therapy and has not and is not married, has not been in a relationship, and is not interested in erectile function, but is obese at presentation. That person, we may look at strategies for um, reducing pressure, reducing risk of fracture reducing obesity and managing social connections, um, improving social support differently than we look at someone who's 43 years old, diagnosed too early with prostate, inactive surveillance, trying to prevent progression to surgery, radiation, or androgen deprivation therapy. In that person, we may be looking at really tightening up uh, metabolic markers to reduce the risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease, but getting tighter in those markers than the average doctor would be comfortable with. For example, a triglyceride under 50 or uh, an LDL under 50, not just under 100 or under 150. So it depends on the person and it depends on the risk. For a 43-year-old or a 53-year-old or 63-year-old um, married to a 43 or a 53 year old, that marital bond is so important. So we're looking at risk of erectile function for someone on ADT already, you know, with advanced disease, we're looking at quality of life, risk of fracture, risk of um, obesity, social connection, those kinds of things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I, I I can't tell you how much this was really helpful tonight. I really appreciate uh, both you and Dr. Mensa for actually educating all of us, teaching us all something, for analyzing me, making me feel good that I'm not depressed. <laughs> I didn't say I was depressed, but uh, I didn't do a screen on anxiety. <laughs> but that's good. We'll we'll find that out on our next survivorship event. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, for all of you who uh, want to see this in its entirety, feel free to go to our YouTube channel. It will be posted on there. Um, and as well, uh, it'll be available on our Facebook uh, post as well. Uh, if you'd like to listen to our podcast, we'll be adding some new ones this year. And it's available on Spotify, Pandora, or on our MIUmensHealthFoundation.org site. Again, thank you to our sponsors. Without them, we wouldn't be able to afford to do what we do and help the community with Lanthius, Bear, Blue Earth Diagnostics, and of course, the American Cancer Society. If you have a topic or a guest that you'd like us to have of interest on these future events, please feel free to uh, contact us at info at MIUmensHealthFoundation.org. Uh, and as far as our upcoming events, uh, please uh, check out our site at uh, MIUmensHealthFoundation.org for Blue Monday Men's Health on June 12th, Cogs and Kegs on the same day, our gala at Top Golf, and finally our Run for the Ribbon at the Detroit Zoo. I want to thank all of you for attending. I definitely want to thank uh, Drs. Mensa and Roy uh, for being here, for always being here, for having been here in the past and always being a great supporter of our foundation and our community and, and truly making holistic care something that is now going to be more mainstream than it has ever been. So thank you so much. Yeah, it was our honor. Thank you.